This morning's passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 through 5. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Mike. Good morning again. How's everybody? Good to see a few faces here I haven't seen for a while. Great to see you today. Um, you know, things, things are going up. Things are, things are rising right now. The, the temperatures are rising, right? I mean, this whole summer, it's been hot. Um, I'm not accustomed in the summer to get as tan as I've gotten this year, but it's been so hot. I mean, you go outside, you get, you get burned up pretty quickly. And gas prices, as you've noticed, are also starting to really go up. And so these kinds of things, they're, they're in a way, you know, they're day-to-day life, but in another way, they're a big deal, right? In another way, they bring additional stress, they bring additional pressure, you know, the, the heat goes up, your, your heating bills, your air-conditioned bill goes up, your electric bill, these kinds of things, right? So there's extra pressure. One thing that Jesus is there for us always, right, is, is if you're weary, if you're tired, if you're burdened, Jesus says, come to me. In Matthew. The problems that we have in life and the difficulties, the tribulations sometimes, the things that we have in life that are difficult, we look at them like an inconvenience, But within the total economy of grace, they're a means that God uses to draw us closer to him, right? Because Jesus is our rock. Jesus is your rock, you know? Your family members might be totally fantastic and great and wonderful, and they may offer you tremendous support, and they should. But at the end of the day, Jesus is your rock, You know, and that goes for each and every one of us. Although your brothers and sisters in Christ are wonderful people and support you and care for you, at the end of the day, Jesus is your rock. So I'm just encouraging you before we get going today, if you're facing difficulties and problems now, go to Jesus. He'll he'll make your burden lighter. Of course, you know, call the church. We'll help you in any way we can. I mean, I'm not I'm not excluded. The church is if, if I can say it this way, just for this one example, the, the church is Jesus' arm, right? So, so, so we can serve when you call on Jesus. We can serve you too, right? Most people, we've got kind of an intricate topic today, I think, topic today, and I'm not going to try to over, overdo it, but I'm going to get into it a little bit in certain areas That might surprise some. Most people do things because they're prompted to do so. They're either prompted or receive social pressure, right? When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, we used to talk a lot about peer pressure. I don't hear that term that much anymore. Maybe it's out there and I'm just clueless. But, you know, really that's one of the difficulties with social media. Social media is peer pressure, but it's peer pressure magnified times a hundred or a thousand, 
right? It's not just the immediate people that you know, but it's all this whole big, vast network of people that young people may not know that are also reviewing their behavior or their comments. So that's one of the reasons why younger people are having more emotional things now. It's because there's a tremendous amount of peer pressure, right? It's again talking about the sun. It's one thing to it's one thing to sit in the to sit or stand or walk or swim out in the sun. It's another thing to sit in your car without the air conditioning running in the sun as the glass magnifies the sun and the heat in there against your skin. And that's like what this social media does with the peer pressure to the younger people. But it's basically built on, and it's built on something we see in our passage today, it's built on the fact that people do things mainly because they're prompted to do so or receive social pressure to do so. All cultures work this way. If you're a student of history, a student of culture, a student of political science, a student of philosophy, a student of sociology, then you will learn through any of those uh, mediums that to some extent all cultures work this way to an extent, although how they do it exactly differs a little bit. For example, in some cultures, family is very important. It's so important. It's so important historically that you would never, ever do anything to let down or embarrass your family. There have been cultures, especially some ancient cultures throughout history, that a person would commit, commit suicide before embarrassing their family. Therefore, families and the hierarchies within, in them exact tremendous pressure. But in almost every culture throughout history, no one, and I mean no one, wants to be embarrassed, humiliated, put to shame, or lose face. This has been a nearly universal trait in cultures since the fall. You can see, you can see the impulse to it occur in the fall. This has been a nearly universal trait in cultures since the fall, and almost all adhere to it except those individuals who are either enlightened by God in a certain way or those who are hardened criminals and have no regard for others in their thinking. Social pressure can be good or bad depending on the objective. Think about that propositionally. Social pressure can be good or bad depending on the objective. Our passage today still involves the collection. I, I, I personally am never comfortable talking about money in the church. I never, ever, I never, ever have been. I mean, ironically, the first job I was ever asked to serve in the church after I'd been a Christian just a few years was to, was to carry the plate up the aisle. One of the officers in the church asked me to do that. And I felt very unworthy to do that. I mean, I was such an immature Christian. I thought, my hands aren't clean enough to carry this plate. But he asked me, so I did it. So I'm not comfortable talking about money and the collection, but again, Paul is, is belaboring this point with the Corinthians, and we're going through the scripture verse by verse and passage by passage. So our passage today still involves the collection. Paul prompts the Corinthian church to give generously, listen carefully, to give generously by appealing to their sense of shame, embarrassment, and humiliation. He urges them to save face, but for the right reason. They made a commitment, and it was a good commitment. They made a commitment, and it was a good commitment. Paul also helps them. He sends them helpers ahead of time so that they will not end up being embarrassed and humiliated. This also is an act of grace. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, No matter where we come from, no matter what place we come from, no matter what experiences we've had, no matter um, no matter no matter what we've done right or wrong, if we're saved by Jesus Christ, we're in Jesus Christ, we're all brothers and sisters 
together. And, and we're all equal, and we're all called to love each other sacrificially. Help us to learn, Lord. And, and even this collection is part of this sacrificial loving of other Christians and the Gentile Christians loving the, the, the Jewish uh, Christians in Jerusalem. Even this collection is part of that, that love and that extended care. So help us to keep the big picture in mind as we kind of get into some more detailed things that Paul shows us in the passage. Help us all to learn, Lord. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? Don't shout it out. You know, just put it up here, call it up. When did you feel the most ashamed of yourself? Uh, Perhaps your mother caught you alone with your girlfriend when you were a teenager. Or perhaps your father caught you lying to him about breaking the window or or taking the family car. You know, I used to sneak I used to sneak the family car when I was about 15 and a half and I had my per- kids don't do the not kids teenagers don't do this. When I was about 15 and a half I had my permit. I I my parents would wake up about 7, so I'd wake up at about 5 and I'd go for a drive by myself, you know. Luckily I never encountered a police officer doing that. Perhaps the worst thing you ever did was that your favorite teacher caught you cheating on a test. Or maybe it was something much worse than all of these things. Maybe you lied and cheated on your taxes for years, your federal taxes, and now you face fines, garnishment of wages, and even possible jail time. Who knows what you did that embarrasses you the most? Only you know, you and God. God wants to save you from these humiliations, and so does Paul. True, we can learn from shame, but often we don't. The best formula for us all is the most honest one. Hold a steady job, right? When did that stop being a concept in society? Hold a steady job. Keep your commitments Pay your bills. Maintain good credit. Owe no man anything, as the Bible says. Be a good neighbor and a true friend. Serve your church and family. And always keep your word. When did these things stop mattering to our society? If you do these things, men, if I'm speaking to you now, men, if you do these things, you will seldom be put to shame. Seldom. What's going on in our text today is that the Corinthian church committed to making a good offering to the poor saints in Jerusalem. They started to do this in the previous year. Now they're in danger of not keeping their commitment, of not being quote unquote good neighbors, of not serving the church and their brothers and sisters in Christ. In short, they're in danger of shame embarrassment and humiliation. And Paul is prompting them. He is prompting them to save them from that. Okay, our title today, Keeping Commitments and Saving Face. Keeping Commitments and Saving Face. 2 Corinthians 9, 1 to 5. Point one, Paul gently reminds the Corinthian church of their commitment. That's verses one and two. Point two, Paul helps the Corinthians keep their commitments or commitment. That's verses three and five. And point three, if the Corinthians do not keep their commitment, they will lose face. That's verse four. Again, our title, keeping your commitments and avoiding embarrassment. Please read verses 1 and 2 with me. This is point 1. Paul gently reminds the Corinthian church of their commitment. Now, it is superfluous when I 
for many years, I read this word before I ever saw any, or heard anybody say it. So I used to always read it in, the, in my mind's eye, superfluous. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness. He's saying, I know your readiness to give. We talked about that last week. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Acacia, now keep in mind Corinth is the capital of that province. So saying that Acacia has been ready to give since last year. See? Previous commitment. And your zeal, your commitment, in other words, has stirred up most of them. So in other words, it was the commitment of the Corinthian church which helped stir up. Remember, we talked a few weeks ago about the, the, the poor Macedonian churches, very poor folks giving so much. Well, part of, part of what encouraged them to do that was hearing of the great Corinthian commitment. Uh, At first blush, this entire uh, two verses to me seems sort of odd, right? I mean, that's why I just explained it a little bit. If you don't bear in mind how much the poor Macedonians sacrifice to make a good offering, and you don't keep in mind that the Corinthians are rich, we talked about this a couple sermons ago, then, then, then you wonder why, why is this being thrust forward to the surface so directly? But the Corinthians are rich, and even though the Macedonians have already made their offering, the poor Macedonians, the rich Corinthians, after a year, have not been able to get their offering together. Now, sometimes this happens, right? Things fall behind schedule. I'm richer than the federal government. Look at all the trillions of dollars the federal government's in debt. I'm not in debt. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter how much you've got like this Corinthians if you're going to misuse your money all day long. Right? So they're not keeping their commitment. They weren't able to get it together. But in the meantime, Paul bragged on the Corinthians to the Macedonians. I like to put things in terms um, everyone can understand. How many of you have siblings? Brothers, physical, biological brothers and sisters. How many of you feel a commitment to them? If they were sick or in desperate situations, you would take your money to care for them. How many of you would do that? Okay, most of you would, right? I think. So let's say you have three healthy brothers or sisters, but the fourth one becomes ill and can no longer work. The three agree they will each give $1,000 a month to their poor and sick brother. This is not like an LSAT question, okay? The three agree they will each give $1,000 a month to their poor and sick brother. But then the time comes to collect... And the richest brother, the very richest brother, the one who's by far the richest, says, no, I can't do it. I've got too many problems and bills of my own. This could become a very embarrassing situation, not only for the rich brother, but for the whole family, as, these, as those outside of the family see the poor and sick brother who cannot work, wasting away, and not being cared for by their family. Just so it could become for the poor Jerusalem church if their rich brothers and sisters in Corinth do not keep their commitment. Those outside the family, those who are not Christians, will ask, where is the family in this? Where is the faith in this? Where is the love and cooperation in this? It used to be, used to be in America, and especially in rural America, that if you broke your word, I grew up under this. I know it's there. If you broke your word, if you broke your commitment, you were out. You became an outsider. You were shunned. 
But something has changed in America. So many people lie, cheat, and steal now. Even established businesses, even major corporations, that no one seems to care if you keep your commitments and your word anymore. People break them all the time with the flimsiest excuses. Guess what? A commitment is a commitment precisely because you have accurately calculated ahead of time what you are able to do and what you are not able to do. Barring an act of God, you keep all of your commitments or it is called a lie. When we don't keep our commitments, when we lie about what we're going to do or not do, it hurts other people. When we keep our commitments, when we keep our word, it helps other people. So in verses 1 and 2, Paul is simply reminding the Corinthian church of their commitment to give and how it affected others. It's already affected others. They can't take it back now. It's already affected others. Look at the end of verse 2 again. He says, the Corinthians, or Acacia, the province, that their commitment to readily give stirred up many in Macedonia to do the same. Paul is now encouraging the Corinthians, if I can say it this way, to remember their first love. You know, usually when somebody's a Christian for six months or a year or, or, or two years, if they've had a true salvation experience, if, if, if they've been born anew, born again, born anew, if, if the Lord has saved them, that, that, that Jesus is their first love. They're thinking about Jesus all the time. But, you know, the years pass, You know, you've been in church 10 years. You've been in church 20 years. You've been in church 30 years. You've been a Christian 40 years or 50 years. You go, okay, I've heard a a sermon on this passage before, right? I'm not sure I have ever heard a sermon on this passage. That's one of the benefits of preaching through books, that you get sermons on passages otherwise you'd probably never get. I don't think I have ever heard a sermon on this passage. Or, or some of the ones we've done lately. Maybe the one we do next week I've heard a sermon on years ago. Right? But you get bored. You know, well, I know, I know, I know this, I know that. Well, you know, fine, true. But, but what we're all called to do always as, as brothers and sisters, as Christians, is to remember our first love. We keep our commitments and our word to others and other Christians Because of Jesus. I mean, we want to do it for ourselves and because of our integrity. But probably by ourselves, we won't be strong enough. We need Jesus' help. You know, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it hurts to keep your commitments. And in this case, at least with some of the Corinthians, it probably does feel like pain to them. So Paul is reminding them to focus on the truth which also means to focus on Jesus and not to forget their commitments. Point two now, Paul helps the Corinthians keep their commitment. Read verse three and five with me. This is how Paul helps them. I am sending, that's the same, that's the same word for, uh, for apostle that we translate apostle, Right? You can translate that word send or messenger, you know, or you can translate it apostle. When it's the office, you translate it apostle. Just like deacon, you can translate it servant, or you can translate it the office deacon. The word for, uh, for minister, by the way, in Hebrew is also servant. Point three, but I am sending, so Paul is sending, I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter. So in other words, what Paul has said about them, their commitment and how generously they've given, that it'll come true. I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. 
Then jump down to verse five. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and watch the language now and arrange in advance. So they're going to help make this happen. They're going to get it together and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised. They're going to administrate. Arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Paul takes practical action to make sure the Corinthians are ready to give. He sends three esteemed brothers. We covered who they were last week. He sends three esteemed brothers ahead. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was Titus and then two brothers who were not named. One is, one is thought to be, could be Luke or Timothy or Trophimus, and the other we don't know, the scholars. He sends three estimated brothers ahead to help them arrange the promised gift to help them arrange the execution of the gift for one specific reason, so that the Corinthians are not embarrassed. This is a good place to point out that Christians are willing to accept help from others. You know, before I was a Christian, I didn't want help from anybody. Have any of you ever felt that way? I'm going to do this job myself. Nobody's going to talk to me about this. I'm going to get it done. I don't need any help. I got it. That's that's the attitude before you're a Christian. After you're a Christian, the attitude is I want help. I want to cooperate. There are two two different ways of working with other people. Christians are willing, they want help from others. We want help from other Christians and support because we realize we're part of a body. I cannot do much with this hand in terms of throwing a ball. I cannot do much with this hand in terms of throwing a ball unless I've got the wrist and the arm and the shoulder and the torso and the legs and the whole thing behind me. Do you agree with that? I I was a good contact hitter in baseball. I hit for a high average, but I was a poor power hitter because I never managed to get my whole, my whole body behind the bat. That was a defect I had as a hitter, right? So, you know, guys, men, I'm talking to you. We, we want to do things on our own. We want, you know, women tend to be able to cooperate a little bit better, I think, on average than men. But, but we want to do things on our own. We want to uh, get things done. But as Christians, we work together. Uh, At at my first church, there was a woman who served. She served well and she cared. But she always wanted to do everything alone. Not, Not only is this not advisable, it robs other people of sharing their gifts. But America teaches this independence. America Our culture teaches this kind of independence. But God teaches his children interdependence. We don't do things alone. We always have helpers. We always have helpers. Uh, People like Mitzi and Brian and Ruth and Heather are always my helpers. And almost everything I do, they're my helpers. I mean, if you guys send me something, you know they're my helpers. I mean, in everything, they have a share in it. And I have a share in the things that they do as well. So this kind of a pattern is true for all of us together. When a person says, I want to do this and I want to do that, that is for their glory. But when Christians work together, it's for God's glory. For God loves to see us work together, and it is because of him that we do work together. So I'm saying all this because Paul sends three trustworthy brothers ahead to the Corinthians, to the, 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 the Christians in Corinth, that they will work together on this offering to make sure the collection is cared for, as we discussed last week, that it's not last minute. He does this not only to care for the offering, he does this to care for the Corinthians so that they will not regret things later. Have you ever done something and later you regret it? You go, God, what was I thinking? Man, I I must have had I must have had uh, uh, t- 
to have my head examined because I totally missed it in the situation. Paul doesn't want that to happen to the Corinthian church. He doesn't want them to regret later after they're embarrassed throughout Christendom for not keeping their commitment about this offering and coming through as they promised. So he sends help. Okay, point three, our last point. If the Corinthians do not keep their commitment, they will lose face. Okay? That's what I said. This is not exactly the kind of thing you, you often see uh, in the New Testament. It was not stated this clearly. You might read between the lines in terms of actions between people. I mean, the Pharisees were often humiliated for wrongly attacking Jesus, for example. But this is stated very clearly here. Otherwise, out in the open, up front. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we, Paul says, we would be humiliated. Now he's talking about, you know, him, Titus, some of the, maybe he's talking, he could be talking even about Peter and some of the elders back in Jerusalem, Mark. So if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. If the Corinthians do not keep their commitment and give the offering, they will be embarrassed and lose face, as will Paul and many other Christians. Uh, sometimes people bite off more than they can chew. Um, I, uh, whenever I went to a restaurant when I was a kid with my dad, I didn't ever want to order the kid's meal, okay? I wanted to order something big. I wanted a lot of food, but I usually couldn't eat it all, right? I couldn't eat, I couldn't eat a, a, you know, a, a, a steak and a potato and a salad and all these kinds of things, right? I was, I was biting off more than I could chew. So sometimes we do that as people. Uh, sometimes people fake big commitments, then fall short and quit. Paul is telling the Corinthians that if they do this with the promise of their offering, he will be humiliated and they will be humiliated. Both will be embarrassed and lose faith. Usually when we're young, we, we do this a lot, right? We boast about things that we can't perform on. I actually find politicians doing this a lot more now, which is kind of interesting, right? Usually, it used to be that you learned as a kid how much you could do. There was this kid I used to play baseball with. Uh, let's say his name is John. It wasn't John. But John would tell the whole team before he went up to bat every single time that he was going to hit a home run. He'd, he'd come up, you know, everybody's sitting on the bench. He's walking out to the batter circle. And he'd get out there, he'd walk out there, and he'd, he'd, he'd look over at the bench, and John would say, you watch, I'm going to hit a home run this time. Do you think that John hit a home run every time he came up to bat? No, no. He did hit a few, though. I have to give him credit for that. He did hit a few. Maybe he was trying to, you know... Boost himself up, work himself up, encourage himself, maybe. It's okay to be confident. Paul says for being so confident. Sometimes it's okay to be confident. Michael Jordan is confident. But even if you're very good, you have to know that there are other players on the court. Jordan knew how to hit the open man for a three. They built a team around him. He could always hit the open man for the three. Paul recognizes that the Corinthians are having a hard time and may face internal difficulty keeping their commitment to make good on this honorable offering to the Jerusalem Christians. Therefore, he explains to them that this will be very embarrassing. 
He does not twist their arm. He does not pressure them. He simply states the truth and sends them help. When you make, brothers and sisters, now I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it back to us a little carefully here. When you make a big commitment to other people, whether it's people in your family, a friend of yours, somebody at work, you know, we all know people at, at, in jobs who, who overpromise, people at work or people someplace else, people at church, maybe people in one of the clubs you're in, I don't know. When you make a big commitment and don't follow through, it is embarrassing and humiliating. And the bigger the commitment, the more humiliating. I have seen this happen to people. They commit to doing something or taking on some responsibility. When it doesn't work out, they, they make excuses or they try, to, they try to blame shift or they try to do something else to avoid the embarrassment. This may even be at the heart of the conflict. Listen carefully. This may even be at the heart of the conflict between Paul and the Corinthian church. Remember, for weeks we talked about the conflict that's going on, that there's people at the Corinthian church that do not trust Paul, that think that Paul might take the money, that think that Paul has taken money. At the heart of all of this, it may be an issue with some of the people in the Corinthian church that they made this commitment to Paul to give. And they were given responsibility to do so. But then when they couldn't perform, when things went off the tracks, they blamed Paul and accused him before coming to their senses. Paul brings up the offering after reconciling with them precisely because the commitment to the offering may have been a big part of the problem from the beginning. I had a guy... uh, When I managed this department, this is a long time ago. I don't even know if, 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 I might have told you guys about this before. I'm not sure. When I was uh, working and managing, I had, I, had, I had a rule. I never give employees money, my own money. Because it just complicates the relationship, Right? But one time, I had this guy working for I wasn't that old. I was like 35. He's like 30. He's got, uh, he's got two little kids. He makes plenty of money. I don't know what he was doing with it. They're, they're turning off his heat. They're turning off his water. He tells me they're coming. They're going to foreclose on his car. You know, he spends a lot. He had a, he had a Toyota Sequoia. They're going to foreclose on his car. They're going to take his car from him. And he needs money, and he's got to have money. He's going to get thrown out of his apartment. His life is falling apart. And I'm sitting here going, well, geez, now this guy's going to make trouble for me. So I said to myself, okay, okay, I know I've got this rule that I don't, I don't give anybody who works for me money because it complicates the relationship. But, but, but this story is so sad, and I like this guy so much, I'm going to give him money. I asked him how much money he needed. He said $2,000. This is back in, this over 20 years, this is 25 years ago. I said, okay, and I gave him $2,000. Guess what he did? He quit the job two, three weeks later. And I didn't see him again for a year. I did not see him again for a year. Then, after about three or four years, he did, he did come and try to pay me back. He didn't pay me everything back, this guy. He paid me back maybe like 500 He came in one day and did that. And I, I was glad to get that, believe me. I didn't think I'd get anything, right? But essentially, he made a commitment to me that he would pay me back, but, but he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it, and he couldn't do it, right? And it was embarrassing for him, and it was so embarrassing for him that he took off. Paul wants to avoid this kind of a problem with the entire Corinthian church. This could be so embarrassing for them throughout Christendom that if they don't make this offering at all, who knows, maybe some of the people will, will, will run away from the faith. 
Maybe the whole church will run away from the faith. These things even happen today. There's financial conflicts between, you know, um, in the Baptists, the local congregation owns the property, right? It doesn't belong to the denomination. But in a lot of denominations, Anglicans, Methodists, Episcopalians, the denomination can either own all or part of the property. And if they have a financial dispute, and I know church is going through this, if they have a financial dispute, then it has to go to court. Who does the property belong to and how much? The denomination or the congregation, right? So it's not that weird a thought to think that if, if the Corinthians squelch on this offering, that there's going to be some of them that want to just totally break away from the larger church family throughout the Gentile and Jewish world and do their own thing. So Paul brings up this, this huge problem that the Corinthians are having with money and giving after, after he reconciles with them. First, he reconciles with them. We saw that a few weeks ago. In psychology these days, what the Corinthians or some of them may be doing is what would be called transference or sublimation. The real issue is avoided, and there is an attempt to pass it on to another. The Nazis did this to the Jews in World War II. In Christianity, we always strive to recognize our own depravity and deal with that. Please turn to Jeremiah 17. The best thing that any of us can learn to do is to learn to deal with our own depravity and deal with our own depravity. Until we do that, we can't help anybody else with their depravity. It's just like when Jesus says, take the splinter out of your eye or the beam out of your eye before you try to take the splinter out of somebody else's. Because this is what the heart of man, I never get upset with an individual when I feel like they have a dark heart or they don't keep their commitments or they're a liar or something like that, I never get upset at them because I just know they're at a certain place in their heart and I know what the natural situation of a man's or a woman's heart is, right? And it takes God to fix that and we have to cooperate with God through that process and recognize our depravity. I mean, that, you know, that's one way to look at it. Another way to say it is that you're going through the process of sanctification by the Holy Spirit, right? You're developing over time. Some of these issues that you've had since forever, since you were little, are being worked on. But here's the natural. Here's the natural and what happens. So verse 5 of Jeremiah 17. Watch this. Cursed. I remember the first time I read this verse. It, It shook my world. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. What crushed me about this verse was because, number one, that I was this kind of man then, but number two, cursed is he, and number three, that trusting in man and making flesh, making yourself your own strength— is synonymous to turning away from the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited land. Verse 7. Now, here's the good part. Here's who we need to learn to be together over time by God's grace. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Verse 10. Watch this. This applies to you and your life today and me. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. These verses apply to the Corinthian church. 
Paul is trying to teach the entire Corinthian church about their heart, about their selfishness, about their greed. In Paul's thinking, they must keep their commitment for the offering to the poor Jerusalem Christians or face the shame and loss of face that accompanies a broken promise. Fortunately, as Christians, we have Christ standing in the place for our shortcomings before God. Therefore, we can admit our mistakes and ask for forgiveness, even if we feel embarrassed. We easily say and know that we are weak and that we can be failures, but in Christ we are no longer ashamed, but simply caring and sincere. When someone has something against us, we accept responsibility and make the best of it. That is what Paul is asking the Corinthians to do, to keep their commitment rather than to walk in shame and obfuscate or blame others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you... uh, Teach us to walk in an upright manner. And that's another word we could have used today. You, you want us to walk upright, and part of walking upright is keeping our commitments, whether individual or corporate. Lord, please help us to, to faithfully turn to you in this and help us to care for one another. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that, we have met, that you have brought many Christians to Emmanuel that have a willing heart to serve. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.